Anyway, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome you all to this uh, project inception webinar of our project. Uh, it's called the AIMConnect. Uh, as you are aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has shattered all our economies initially by causing supply side disruptions and later uh, the demand side as well. Therefore, building a holistic response that is efficient and resilient is absolutely essential. And for such a development should be a key part of that response system. Thus, it is time to lay focus on improving the multimodal dimensions of connectivity in regions where such infrastructural development is work in progress. Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, also popularly known by the abbreviation BBIN, is one such sub-region where multimodal connectivity can add tremendous growth and resilience to the countries themselves. Let us first remind ourselves that connectivity in the BBIN sub-region has gained significant political momentum in recent years. Irrespective of legitimate concerns regarding the protocols for the regulations of the movements of passenger, personal, and cargo vehicles, the signing of the BBN Motor Vehicles Agreement in 2015 is instrumental in shaping a consensus or providing the platform for creating an enabling environment for seamless connectivity. This is hugely complemented by other milestones such as the India-Bangladesh Coastal Shipping Agreement, Bangladesh's permission to Nepal and Bhutan to use its ports through standalone as well as intermodal transit networks with India. Another successful example is the operationalization of the ADB-initiated electronic cargo tracking system for Nepal-bound cargoes from the Vizac port, the Vizac apartment port in India. Here it is important to note that as landlocked countries, Nepal and Bhutan are significantly dependent on the transport networks of India and Bangladesh. It is heartening to witness that India and Bangladesh have individually as well as jointly moved in a positive direction and a cohesive manner to integrate their direct as well as transit-oriented infrastructure nodes for seamless flow of goods within this region and with the rest of the world. Developing sub-regional connectivity has long been India's foreign policy interest under its what we define as our neighborhood policy, especially when it comes to enhancing cross-border trade and improving access to its northeast region. This has also been reflected in the Prime Minister, Indian Prime Minister's neighborhood first policy and Act East vision. For example, 16th ASEAN India Summit in Bangkok in November 2019, the Prime Minister of India highlighted steps needed to improve surface, maritime, air, and digital connectivity. Similarly, uh, Piyush Goyal, uh, India's Railways, Commerce, and Industries Minister, has highlighted the importance of multiple rail connectivity projects with neighboring countries, especially with Nepal and Bangladesh, as steps to further boost trade and economic relations. Unfortunately, sub regional efforts were eclipsed for a long time as South Asia as a whole has been infamously touted as one of the least integrated and the least connected region in the world. At the level of South SARC or South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, it still remains disabled due to pervasive political issues between India and Pakistan. Nonetheless, the increasingly demonstrated political will for infrastructure and regulatory coherence for seamless connectivity across standalone as well as interoperable infrastructure nodes is particularly steered through the BBI and group of countries. As a result, a seamlessly connected BBI and region is getting more and more importance for greater infra, intra and interregional connectivity in South Asia and with Southeast Asia. Moreover, supporting connectivity efforts of multimodal dimensions 
to both physical and digital infrastructure and policy and regulatory bodies. In fact, and even going beyond, assessing the extent of community ownership for generating a better political buy-in for such projects has become more necessary than ever before, particularly in a post-COVID world. People on the ground need to realize the benefits of such cooperation. In short, it is an imperative to have a grounded initiative that would not just help shape political economy consensus for multimodal connectivity, but also having potential to identify practical solutions to address ground level challenges. Therefore, keeping this context in mind, cuts together with partners in Bangladesh, Bhutan and Nepal, and with the support of uh, UK's Department for International Development is implementing this project in the BBI and sub-region. In doing so, we are pleased to partner with Unnayan Shamana in Bangladesh, Bhutan Media and Communications Initiative, and Nepal Economic Forum to implement this project along with the Transport Division of the Asian Development Bank as a knowledge partner. In due course of its implementation, we will of course be collaborating with a number of other institutions and organizations who have shown interest in to work jointly, such as the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or what is popularly called as JICA, as a potential knowledge partner. With this as a background and context, now let me now talk, turn briefly to elaborate its aims and objectives. This project is about shaping a better and important political economy discourse for multimodal connectivity in the sub-region. It is also an attempt to identify sustainable infrastructure investment opportunities. This is a kind of a twin track approach. We believe that this is an opportune time to create a momentum for continuous improvement in the region's trade and transport infrastructure, including regulatory and digital infrastructure. Among others, that will create jobs and enhance aggregate demand, which will be the two major challenges in a post-COVID-19 world, or including as a result of the COVID-19 world. Going further, the scope is to create an enabling environment for a political economy discourse on multimodal connectivity in the BBI subregion by studying the necessary conditions and factors responsible for successful regional, sub-regional, bilateral connectivity initiatives in Central, South, and Southeast Asian countries. We have to adapt lessons from them. Therefore, and to conclude, the first and inaugural webinar, uh, this one, is a series that we will do this month. Taken together, they seek to solicit views and inputs as well as recommendations that can further guide us in shaping an informed political economy discourse for multimodal connectivity in the BBI and sub-region. Among others, they will deliberate on why and how multimodal connectivity can be better presented as a developmental necessity in the BBI and sub-region, particularly in a post-COVID world. Finally, let me thank Diffit ADB, our partners in Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal, and all the members of the Project Advisory Committee and respective country-based national reference groups for their support and for their support and collaborative efforts in implementing this well-timed project. Together, we will not only really ensure. Sorry, together we will not only ensure timely delivery of quality outputs leading to practical outcomes, but will also create a network of voices for improved connectivity for grounded development. I have to thank you and uh, request uh, Bipul uh, to please uh, take over and conduct the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mehta, for your welcome and opening remarks. We are delighted to have all of you here today in this inaugural session of a series of webinars that Mr. Mehta has, has talked about, which is a digital inception 
meeting which we are doing to launch this project. Now, without any further ado, uh, may I now request uh, Mr. Duncan Warfield uh, from DFID's Asia Regional Team. He's the deputy head of DFID's Asia Regional Team, and he's leading this project uh, program, which is called Asia Regional Trade and Connectivity Program. So, may I request Duncan for your address? Over to you, Duncan. Right. Um, great. Thank you very much, people. Thank you, Pradeep. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've only just come back to my job recently um, as I was actually working on some of the aspects of UK government policy sort of in the, in the region. So it's great to be back. And I just, you know, it's great to just get an opportunity to just talk a little bit about some of these issues that we've all been working on together for some, for some time. I think um, I've been engaged with this since 2013. The team that I work for has been engaged in this for considerably longer. Um, the UK generally has a really high interest in this levels. And why is that, yeah? It's about broader issues to do with what this agenda can do for poverty reduction. It's about issues to do with stability. And it's also to just to do with more sort of you know, stock level issues of UK interest and basically the work that we do contributes to the creation of larger and more stable markets over the long term. So there's a broad range of UK interest in this that we are that we basically push on this. Yeah. Um, and it's been such an extraordinary period in which we've been in, like none of us have ever experienced. We'd have to go back probably several generations basically to have at least two generations to sort of have some notion of, of this level of depth of impact yeah um and things have changed um i do wonder whether this will mean some type of change to uk interests in the region is it going to change our relationships with countries across the region i think it's very difficult to say at the moment but i think we need to be open to sort of broader sort of dialogue around these areas but I think I would say is that issues around connectivity and trade and BBIN collaboration are all here to stay and it's because of the substantive gains that are there to be made and everything that, that, ever, that all the citizens of the region can, can gain from. Um, I mean, I was asked to talk a little bit about sort of connectivity in a broad sense, which I'll, I'll just make a few points on. And I do want to just sort of focus a little bit on C19 and the impacts of that and where that's leaving us before I come back and just make a couple of concluding remarks. So I think the first thing I'd say is that the community of practice has moved on, I think, a long way from a sort of a narrow infrastructure connectivity um, type of um, focus. Um, and certainly the practitioners within that sort of, you know, take a very, very broad and holistic view on that. And it's for the very simple reason that, you know, even the simplest projects or the change in regulations will not work unless the broadly supportive political economy environment is there. Um, the broader environment, I'd say, has been an issue around the whole of the world. It's not, it's not just an issue within BBIN or within Asia or within South Asia. Um, it's there, and that the broader sort of relationships and trust between countries are just critical in terms of sort of moving that forward. And of course, that requires long-term and deep engagement in those relationships in order to support sort of progress on, on these areas. It does require holistic building blocks, um, requires a lot of foundations, um, and it does all start with the politics and it starts with trust and it starts with the willingness to actually work and cooperate with each other um, in the, on the basis of sort of generation of mutual, um, mutual benefits. Um, I think Certainly when I came to this, I wasn't, I wasn't, didn't quite understand that, but getting engaged with a couple of energy projects quickly sort of um, helped me to understand that. One was um, a project that is CASA transmission line working on, a very complex project between Central Asia and South Asia. Um, and the basically 10 years of investment really went into that in terms of the politics and the relationships before the project moved into any type of detailed design. Now that project is well on the way to sort of generating lots of green energy, supporting broader sort of 
um, grid development, broader energy trade sort of across, across the region. Um, but it's only working and it only continues to work because of the growing strength of the relationships between the four countries that are involved in that project and the trust that was built up over a long time. And there are periods, of course, where that trust is um, is particularly tested. You know, The relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan of two of the countries that are in there. It's, it's turbulent and difficult at times, um, but it's sort of it's managed to sort of move beyond that and sort of end that they're both focus on the mutual benefits that are going to come from that. Um, one of the other projects that was on the stocks when I started was just a, a very simple technical connector between the Indian and Pakistani sort of like electricity grids in the Punjab. Um, that project has not surprisingly has just not moved um and of course you know it, it comes down to all the issues in sark and so you know, the, the very difficult relationship between india and pakistan and there's only so much that we can do as, as practitioners of course um so those projects highlight how important it is to take a very broad view and take a good hard look at the politics and the broader political economy issues before sort of trying to move forward on particular areas. And I think this is basically what underlies the success of, of where BBIN has got to here, and it's how how much is actually how much investment has gone in across the countries and from the different partners sort of that, that work with them, of course. Um, I'm just going to take a little a little time just to talk about C19. And maybe what that's done to our environment and some of the concerns that are very in my mind at the moment as I'm sort of coming back into, into my position. Um, has What has it done to our environment around connectivity, inter-regional and in, intra-regional and inter-regional sort of like trade and connectivity? I think the first thing I would say is probably a little bit too early to say. Um, a lot of the analysis is very speculative at the moment. We don't really know how it's going to fully impact, but... It's certainly highlighted a lot of joint dependencies and a lot of risks. You know, and the real issues that we've got around zoonotic disease and what that can do to sort to to tread around the world and within the region. Um, I do have a concern. There's a real danger that countries could pull back with a lot of the consequent losses. Um, and I think the thing that comes most to mind is that as connectivity, as a connectivity set of of, of practitioners, we really need to think about injecting biosecurity into our DNA. Um, and it needs to take a very holistic approach to this. And it's not just about um, border facilities and phytosanitary regulation. It's about a very broader set of things um, that are impacting on this. And we somehow need to make sure that that's built into everything that we actually, we actually do. Uh, it's quite clear that C90 is pushing some ongoing conflicts um, at the margins. We've seen a number of issues between uh, India and China and others, sort of, and I think, you know, C19 is not helping on that. Um, I think BBIN still stands out, though, as a region that is really beginning to sort of to move on some of these things and that there's sufficient trust there and sufficient understanding of the mutual gains to keep things to keep things going through. I do also worry about whether... Um, whether sub-regions will become more fearful of each other um, um, and whether that will impact on sort of a lot of the growing opportunities between particularly between south and southeast asia um, which are of course very very large um, and I've, again it just sort of pushes us towards thinking that we do need to make sure that we are fully engaged with the broader politics sort of around around each each of these things um, um, it's just to think about whether I'm, I'm generally very optimistic about the work that we do in this area, the work that we do with CUTS, the work that we do with our other partners, the work that we do with the national governments all through the region. And I'm generally very optimistic. Now I'm not quite sure whether I'm more optimistic or more pessimistic. Um, I think it's partly I'm waiting to see for a little bit more on the signals that come out perhaps over the next two to three months as, as we start to emerge at different speeds um, from this. But then the thing I would say to all of us is that, of course, we're not passive observers in this. We're part of the community that is creating the opportunities and potentially the challenges for moving forward. Um, I think the UK will continue to take a very broad-based approach and we will actively 
advocate you know, for work in this area. And I don't think that we're going anywhere. We are going to be staying engaged in this for the foreseeable future. Of course, a lot of you will have, will have read about the issues about the movement to merge the UK government's development and deploy. Uncertainties, but I think when we particularly think about this area of work, it actually brings huge amounts of opportunity. The idea of bringing together work that is development, technical, poverty focused in nature, with you know, with our diplomacy colleagues and all of the things that they can do and all their expertise. I think it does perhaps just give us a great opportunity to move to a much more holistic approach within the UK government. And on that point, I think I will just stop and I'll just say thank you very much to Cuts for organising this seminar and I look forward to taking part in the broader debate. Thank you. Back to you, Bipul. Thanks. Thanks, Duncan. <clears throat> Including uh, pointing out uh, this merger which is taking place between DFID and Foreign and Commonwealth Office. As we understand, the renamed office will be Foreign, Commonwealth and Development. So the development part of UK's work is going to remain as important as before. And as you have rightly pointed out, that you are going to look at the development much more holistically and in respect to Britain's uh, foreign policy objectives. So thank you very much. We can talk about that later in, in greater detail as we make progress. So may I now request uh, Mr. Kwan Cheng Wong, who is the uh, senior transport specialist in the Asian Development Bank for his uh, address. Over to you, Quan Chin. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, people, for the introduction. So, Mr. Mehta and uh, Mr. Overfield and uh, webinar participants, including my ADB colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, it is my great honor uh, to speak on behalf of uh, Asian Development Bank, ADB, uh, in this opening section uh, for the inception webinar uh, series uh, for the project uh, enabling a political uh, economy discourse for multimodal connectivity uh, in the BBIN region or the BBIN's M Connect project in short. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank COTS International, especially the team led by um, Bipu uh, for the great effort in conducting this timely and uh, impactful project. Uh, including the nice arrangement of this inception webinar series. Okay. Uh, BBIN has been uh, I'd recognized as a sub-region folder of economical potential. Uh, and uh, we all understand RCI, uh, RCI, regional cooperation and integration is the key to success. Uh, fostering RCI has been highlighted as one of the seven operational priority for ADB's stretch 2030. Uh, ADB's RCI strat strategic objectives includes uh, greater and higher quality connectivity between economies, expanded global and regional uh, trade and investment opportunities, and increased and diversified regional public goods. Um, RCI, uh, in particular transport connectivity is a precondition or an enabler for ADB's operational priority about poverty reduction and the rural development. Uh, in addition, it has a close relationship with the rest of the uh, operational priority, including governance and the institutional capability, climate change, uh, livable cities, and gender equality. Um, in addition to the various support to many sub-regional programs in the Asia Pacific region, ADB has been served as the secret, uh, Secretariat of GMS the Great Mekong Sub-Region, CARAC, Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation, and the SASEC, South Asia Sub-Regional Economic Cooperation. Uh, based on the draft the SASEC Operational Plan 2020 to 2022, there are 65 projects listed. Um, among the four focused areas, there are 38 projects for transport, 15 for trade facilitation, and the nine for energy, and the three for economical corridor development. So I believe we, we all can imagine how crucial this uh, BBIN M Connect project is for the action plan of success. Um, 
the economic growth of the BBIN countries has been impressive. And we all expect this trend to continue. Uh, this growth will support economic um, opportunities, quality jobs, poverty elimination, and improve the quality of life. In particular, BBIN countries are well positioned geographically to connect Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central and West Asia, and it has the position to move up in the global value chain. We have seen the progress in the BBIN MVA uh, motor vehicle agreement, which will be a game changer for the transport sector in the sub-region. In addition, BBIN countries are pursuing uh, increased usage of inland, inland waterways. Uh, the development of logistic hubs will provide a maximum uh, multimodal connectivity possibilities. And uh, finally, Chittagram and the Mangala ports in Bangladesh has been used for the movement of goods in India. At the same time, the short seat short shipping route provides an alternative to the congested land transportation and the further expand the hinterlands of the seaport. So I do believe there will be more and more large ships calling the port in the region. Before the end of last year uh, for Bangladesh, the concept paper for an ADB project, SASEC, the Integrated Trade Facilitation Sector Development Program was approved. Uh, this 150 million long and the 1 million technical assistance grant uh, is Another example of ADB's commitment for the transport connectivity enhancement and the trade facilitation in the BBI region. Uh, the <coughs> output covers uh, custom legal framework improvement and the alignment with international standards, cargo clearance process, institutional capacity, and the trade and the transportation infrastructure, which includes the land custom stations, land ports, access road, railway cargo handling facility for border crossing points, uh, Dhaka Central Customs Laboratory and the Regional Training Center. Um, we understand that while we have this online meeting today, the COVID-19 has brought global travel to an unprecedented hold. Uh, around the world, we have seen grounded airplanes, vacant hotel rooms, and there were millions of people has lost the uh, their livelihood and the country's GDPs has been stunned. ADB has responded with the 20 million package to address the need of the developing countries. However, we do believe we should play a role beyond financial relief. As borders slowly reopened, countries are seeking to balance the economic recovery and the health and well-being of their own citizens. We, we must take a coordinated and harmonized approach. Uh, with this in mind, ADB will continue to collaborate with our partners. Um, we are looking forward to hearing from you, uh, to, uh, to learn from your expertise and uh, to work together to, uh, toward the concrete steps for enhancing the multimodal connectivity in the BBI region. Uh, thank, you for you, uh, thank you for participating in today's dialogue. Uh, wish you a healthy, healthy body and a peaceful mind. Yeah, during this NPD time. Thank you. Yeah, over to you, people. Thank you, Guan Chen. Uh, before we move to the presentation, Meta, do you would you like to add anything? Uh, no, no particular thing. But I, I think that the presentation and uh, the feedback and the inputs from the audience will be the most useful. Yeah, thank you. No particular Thank comments. You. Yeah. Okay, so let us uh, move to the presentation. Of course, we are going to have uh, time for taking some questions and doing some question and answer session. So may I request my colleagues to put the presentation on the screen? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, this is uh, 
the inception webinar from the from beginning this is beginning yeah and i'm going to make a very brief presentation as mr mehta has pointed out and also uh, underlined by both uh, duncan and quenching in their speeches that how important this multimodal connectivity is not just for developing some infrastructure but you have to look at it much more holistically so this presentation which as i said is going to be very brief uh here as against just talking what we are going to do is to show you certain some maps to have a better understanding of uh, the importance of multimodal connectivity in this um, sub region bbi in bangladesh bhutan india and nepal sub region so next slide please so if i look at the current landscape how do i do this so, yeah so bbi and motor vehicles agreement and despite all these delays and concerns which has really been a catalyst for greater sub regional connectivity the reason being that we have been talking about regional connectivity for a long time which is part of the sarc process but somehow it was not moving then india along with its neighboring countries we decided to go ahead and look for sub regional connectivity so we signed this motor vehicles agreement in 2005 and as we understand that the protocols for both passenger and uh, what do you call personal car, uh, vehicular movement as well as cargo movements they are more or less ready and as a result of that uh, we are supposed to initiate the implementation of this agreement in this summer but due to covid 19 i think it's going to be delayed how much delay we don't do not really, really know but we hope that situation is going to improve soon and we are going to see the implementation of this agreement we do understand the concerns particularly the environmental concerns which were uh, highlighted by bhutan and Bhutan has, uh, as a result of those concerns, it has decided to opt out. But there is also an opt-in clause in there. So, as and when those concerns are going to be resolved, we, we are going to welcome Bhutan into this uh, implementation of this agreement. But what is much more important, I guess, is this growth of bilateral connectivity, whether it is road or rail or waterways or airways between. india and bangladesh every other day we, we we see that some initiative or the other is being taken very recently we, we have seen that there is a second i mean addendum to the protocol on inland water transit and trade between india and bangladesh a number of new port of calls uh, have been considered as a result of that addendum and that is really going to enhance inland waterways trade or trade via inland waterways between these two countries as we know there are 54 rivers transboundary rivers between india and bangladesh and many of them uh, rather all of them they used to be the the connectivity mode at one point of time and it is very good to see that those uh, older connectivity modes uh, are being revived now similarly for rail again india and bangladesh before 1947 even till 1965 the rail network was very good now they are being revived so that uh, there is we can do more much more trade much more passenger movements people to people contact as a result of rail railways now the third important point is that india start or trust on infrastructure transformation and it is gaining momentum not just for railways it is also for waterways for airways for railways and of course roadways and we are now coming up with a number of multimodal logistic paths uh, particularly i am given the example of jogi gopa in assam which is in northeast india 
and this multimodal logistics parks they are going to they are likely to be a game changer for fostering multimodal connectivity in the, in this region Now the important point here is also for greater scope for Nepal and Bhutan, which, uh, which are landlocked countries. And uh, they are access to sea by the use of, as well as integrating with existing and those which are developing intermodal and multimodal infrastructure between India and Bangladesh. And this is already being uh, uh, operational. And in next slide or next, next slide, I'm going to show you the map about how Bhutan is gaining access to Chittagong seaport uh, as a result of this intermodal connectivity involving India, Bhutan, and, and Bangladesh. Next slide. Now, when you talk about multimodal connectivity, you have to understand the number of growth drivers. Uh, I mean, of course, as a result of this pandemic, uh, economic revival becomes very, very important. As we have seen, starting with the supply side shock, uh, is likely or it is already spilling over in, onto the demand side. So I think infrastructure development is going to be one of those critical areas where large scale employment can be generated, which can then in turn uh, enhance aggregate demand in the system and which will help us uh, in getting our growth back and not just that in a much more resilient manner so that along with growth we can also have better job creation for the for the benefit of the people and therefore this political consensus which is developing to leverage each other transport and transit oriented infrastructure network that's very very important and here we are looking at connectivity, infrastructure, as well as the new developments which are taking place, not just in physical sense, but also in other important factors which you need to keep in, take into account, which is regulatory, digital, and technical and operational coherence, which are also important. So the essential point here is that <clears throat> These countries are no longer looking at their transport and uh, transport infrastructure in, in silos, but in respect to regional cooperation, in respect to regional connectivity initiatives, which we can leverage from each other's uh, infrastructure development initiatives. And here it is another important point is to understand the availability of electronic tools, I mean, like the electronic cargo tracking system and other digital technologies, which are already available and some of them are already operational. As uh, Mr. Mehta said in his initial uh, address, that this electronic cargo tracking system between, which is uh, being used for Nepal's transit cargo from Vizak port to various parts of Nepal, that has reduced the time and cost of doing trade in a big way. And that is something which it will be important to replicate it in, in, in other uh, connectivity initiatives uh, as, as we move along. Next, please. So therefore, coming to this, uh, the core of today's presentation, multimodal connectivity in the BBI in region, sub-region, let me now explain this uh, with the importance of it with the help of some maps. This is one initiative which is uh, gaining more and more importance. You see this India-Bangladesh Coastal Shipping Agreement, uh, which has helped both countries to enhance their trade via coastal shipping. And the importance cannot be, we cannot overemphasize it, particularly during this period when all land borders for trade between India and Bangladesh are closed due to COVID-19. And this was the only option which was available, other than the railway option, of course, that was used hugely uh, for continuing the trade between India and Bangladesh. And as you can see that the number of major cargo producing areas are 
they are in our east coast uh, which is in fact this east coast is parallel to another very important adb initiative which is the east coast corridor development initiative now when we have that we have roadways we have railways as well as we have this coastal shipping all, all these ports so it will be very easy for taking goods from producing areas to consuming areas at a, at a much less time and much less cost if we can have if we can use this coastal shipping agreement or the provisions of it along with various other infrastructure development initiatives which are taking place in this part of the world in this part of the region here i would like to also emphasize emphasize another initiative which is being taken by the world bank very recently in india which is called eastern water grid initiative eastern waterway grid and they are not just looking at waterways not just the river ganges and brahmaputra and their tributaries but also looking at how that can be linked with the coastal shipping agreement between india and bangladesh so nicely we are going to have a multimodal connectivity initiative in place which is not just inland but also it is going to include our coastal shipping not just within this region but also with outside world and this is going to help us in strengthening our linkages with southeast asian countries next slide please talking about waterways this is another uh, initiative or other set of initiatives which uh, we are talking about and uh, this is definitely very much multimodal as you can see a number of waterways between chittagong division or sorry chittagong port with dhaka and then mongla port haldia port and via sundarbans this this is also operational now if we can expand this map and include other connectivity initiatives then we can see that these are the areas which can act actually act as nodes for multimodal connectivity in this sub region and we can easily link bhutan via india with bangladesh nepal via ganges with all these nodes and then there are railways there are railways as well uh, we have to also do further work on this map to understand that how important the multimodal connectivity can be in order to develop this part of the of the region now let me further underline the importance of multimodal connectivity for looking at the trade between bhutan and bangladesh via india so you see this funsoling this area this uh, is the gateway to bhutan and from there to dhubri the major a major port in brahmaputra river in assam is just about 160 uh, kilometers so what is happening now as a result of an agreement involving three parties india bangladesh and uh, uh, bhutan now trucks are carrying goods from bhutan to dhubri port they are unloaded and then loaded into bangladeshi barges and sh or ships and they are going right up to naranganj which is near dhaka and from there again port so this is a very good example of uh, multimodal connectivity involving these three three countries similarly there can be I mean, which we have not shown in this presentation from nepal goods can come to varanasi by 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 waterway and then take the waterway route or railway route to come to kolkata or it can even go to northeast part of india from kolkata to bangladesh or to our uh, out, outside the region so there are number of ways uh, where uh, by which we can uh, look at this uh, connectivity initiatives and it will not be much of a difficulty through some investment new infrastructure development connecting dots it will not be much of a difficulty to create multimodal connectivity nodes 
in, in various places, in various locations, critical locations in this uh, region. Next, please. Yeah. Here, I would like to particularly point out one initiative which I think we should take. And this is, again, to underline the importance of multimodal connectivity. Here is a place called Tetulia in Bangladesh, which is, a, which is on the north, northern part of Bangladesh. Now, this particular place, this particular location, and this is a very much political demand in both in Northern West Bengal and in Northwest India, sorry, Northeast India, for the last 40 years. Now, if we look at this location of this place, which you can look at from in this uh, uh, map, that this Jalpaiguri district, from where the Asian highway network is going, is right next to this subdiv subdivision or subdistrict in, in Bangladesh. Now, if we can link the NH30, National Highway 34 of India, which is going right up to North Bengal, with Jalpaiguri via Tetulia, we can, we can create an elevated uh, link road, for example. It's just four kilometers. So it's a connection between India, from India to another part of India, very close to each other. But in between this four kilometer corridor is there. So if we can create this corridor, then we can easily do two things. A, to create a much robust cross-border transport network, and B, it will be an alternate to Siliguri corridor, which is the only corridor which we have to connect with Northeast India. So from security point of view, it is also very important to, for us to create another uh, alternate corridor other than reducing the length by about 85 kilometers for our linkage, for our connectivity with Northeast India. So this is something which we think that government of Bangladesh and government of India should work together to make this happen. And people in this region are going to be very, very happy. Similar initiative is already there. Already there is this thin bigger corridor, which is Bangladesh to Bangladesh through India, which already exists. So we have that examples and how happy people are on the ground as a result of such initiatives. So we need to look at those things very, very carefully. And here our proposal is to have a, it's just four kilometers. You add few kilometers on both sides and link it to Asian Highway Network. So at the most, it is going to be 10 to 12 kilometers. And we can have an elevated road with all security features, um, including along with electronic cargo tracking system. And Bangladesh government is going to get the royalty. So it's going to be win-win situation for both Bangladesh and India if this corridor is developed. Now, as, a, as we implement this project multi on multimodal connectivity, we're not just going to look at the BBIN, but I think we should also look at BBIN plus, which we are, I mean, I'm going to give just one example and how important Myanmar is and the number of initiatives which are taking place in Myanmar, particularly the development of Kaladan multimodal uh, trade and transport project, the India, Myanmar, Thailand trilateral highway project, the c 2 a port. And if we look at all these things, and here is the border in, uh, in Mizoram, as well as in Manipur, in Kalawea, and, and in Jaipur. And these projects are about to be completed. And by 2021, we hope that all roads linking from c 2 a to Maladan, sorry, Kaladan multimodal project site, is one stretch which is still uh, remain to be developed. Then, Along with Asian Highway Network, this project or set of projects can be very good example, not just Asian Highway Network, I'm sorry, but also Asian Railway Network, which can act as gateways through multimodal connectivity between this part of South Asia and Southeast Asia. And that I think is going to help us in, uh, in what you call uh, uh, in fostering greater linkages with uh, 
new hubs of uh, global value chains, which are already emerging in, in, in some countries in, in Southeast Asia. So with that, yeah, what a minute. So let me now uh, stop this, uh, come to an end to this presentation. I thank you. And I think uh, together with our partners, with support from DFID, uh, with uh, knowledge and expertise from ADB, and our partnership with our partners uh, from Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal, I think we'll be able to not just to not just to uh, achieve the objectives of this project and come out with certain outputs, but also outcomes related to new connectiv connectivity initiatives. We are going to identify new investment opportunities, which would then help agencies like ADB or JICA, World Bank, even DFID and others to invest either directly or jointly uh, with Indian government and other governments to have further connectivity initiatives, which uh, both Duncan and Quanjing has pointed out that we need to look at much more holistically. So let me stop here and uh, now open the floor, the digital floor for questions and answers. So Duncan and Quanjing to begin, do you have anything to add or share about your thoughts on the on the presentation thank you Pithal. is it okay if i jump in first yes please yeah thank you so but thank thank you very much for that presentation i think the fantastic thing of bringing maps in it basically moves us from an abstract discussion to a to i think these are actually really quite significant concrete things that we can do that we can do on the ground and there are quite clearly lots of early opportunities there basically that we can actually start to start to focus on things where there's quite a lot of progress already um i think my i think i don't have specific questions there other than to say we've, we we do have some serious opportunities here yeah and i think that the question that i think we probably need to think through is like what are the next, it's almost like the timelines, what are the next steps, Where do, what, what do we need to work through, what is it that we need to push in particular, you know, what are the practical stepwise things that we need to do to get us from where we are now to where we can clearly see where, where the opportunity is. Um, I think that would be my, my sort of like my broad point at this stage. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you completely, Duncan. I mean, that is something which we need to discuss among ourselves uh, in a uh, in a much more detailed manner. We have already started identifying a uh, number of initiatives. Uh, I think so far we have identified three or four. My colleagues, they would know more, including some of them in Northeast India, which can actually help in fostering much more, um, uh, much more enabled, I would say, multimodal connectivity in this sub-region. Cheng, do you have any, any point to make? At okay. This yeah, uh, based on the presentation, that's um, uh, I was very uh, impressed, especially those uh, illustration by maps, and uh, it appears to me there's a, there's a lot of potential, uh, but at the same time, it seems quite easy to draw the, a line on the map, but however, that's we can expect that there's actually quite a lot of difficulty or challenging issues associated. So I was very impressed by uh, the grassroots approach when I first uh, have a, had a look at the, the project proposal. And I, I do believe that uh, that's a very good approach uh, to really uh, to fully utilize, uh, realize the potential. And uh, I personally have done some modeling work uh, but uh, that's really theoretical. So uh, I'm looking forward to to see the intensive discussion and uh, to understand the the, the really uh, bottlenecks, uh, soft or hard. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, exactly. That is the point. I mean, we we know that agencies like ADB they are very good in doing the transport modeling and related uh, technical work. At the same time, is it important when we were talking about connectivity? It's not just the technical matters. It's not just concrete infrastructure. We need to understand what people are thinking on the ground. 
and that that way i think we are complementing each other very well uh, and that will also help you in understanding the value uh, that for example your investment in a particular project that is going to bring to the table and that is that's where i think the importance of our field work comes in mm -hmm. and together uh, let me go back to the last slide of my presentation together i think we can together means along with our partners uh, in bangladesh bhutan and nepal we are fortunate to have very good partners with some of them we have been working with uh, for over the last 25 years so and they know the ground realities um, including the networking strength which we have developed in northeast india uh, in particular uh, not just in eastern india so we are going to and that is where the political economy dimensions of the project is going to come what people on the ground what they are thinking what value that they expect from all this initiative that that they expect to get and that brings me to a question which uh, very nicely i would say uh, which is posed by professor mustafizur rahman who is a distinguished fellow at the center for policy dialogue in dhaka in bangladesh uh, uh, his his as one observation about uh, he is talking about the benapol petropol border which is the largest land border in asia in the asia pacific region and i don't rem exactly remember the volume of trade which is uh, happening uh, uh, through this land port but the point is that this location is very very critical for trade between india and bangladesh in particular and also between india and india between the mainland india to northeast india at the same time the challenge is that though we have developed infrastructure over the years and some good infrastructure is there but the congestion is still very much there because the approach areas are very much congested and here i think the comes the importance of other modes of transportation if we can consider railways a railway line is already there uh it is somehow dysfunctional uh because of non use after 1965 it is not going to require much of investment to revive that railway link and with the bridge which is coming up over the river padma in bangladesh which is a dual purpose bridge both road and railways through this uh benapol petropol railway line that is going to be linked with the padma bridge so we can actually revive the old railway link which my father and grandfather they used to take uh and there are many such examples sorry about that <clears throat> but the point is that there are very strong political very interesting and political economy thousands of people are engaged they are employed in this border post for loading and loading transshipment so their livelihood is going to be at stake if the trade is shifted from roadways to railways so how are you going to reengage them in what kind of activities that's something which we need to look at very very carefully and that is something which we are going to get from our uh, field work can you come to the next point which is posed by my colleague i think i've sort of answered it uh, a harmonious relationship between bbi and countries and to ensure that they uh, together they develop the political and they take into account the political economy aspects of connectivity and that is something definitely we are going to do uh, with our field work now mr purushottam ojha is a former commerce secretary of nepal he posed a question or rather an observation first that bbi and motor vehicles agreement is on hold over the last few years because we are yet to finalize the operational protocol so when we can expect 
this operationalization of this agreement. As I said before, I mean, the protocols are now ready. The uh, uh, passenger protocols, both for personal vehicles and for passenger vehicles, they are, uh, they have been initialized. I mean, the initials are, are done. The cargo protocols, they are also final. We were supposed to have a meeting in May this year. Uh, but that meeting didn't take place, or maybe it was done virtually. But uh, I think once this COVID-19 uh, challenges are somehow over, I, I'm not going to say that it's going to be over very soon, but I think we are going to we'll be in a position to operationalize it. But here comes the important, a very important point that Nankan has made in his remarks. Uh, which is we should not we rather we cannot not the question of food or not but we cannot look at trade and cross-border trade and transit in isolation no longer we have to look into that them along with biosecurity biosafety you see so here comes the importance of safe trade initiative the how can we make trade safer cross-border trade i'm talking about at the border post. Here, the good thing is that we already have some examples from around the world, and particularly emphasize, or rather, I would underline the good practice or practices which have been developed in East Africa under the aegis of the Trademark East Africa Initiative, which is again a, another DFID supported initiative, and it has been going on for a number of years. And though I am yet to get to know the details of it, but what I do know that cross-border trade through land border in East Africa is now restored fully as a result of this safe trade initiative uh, of trademark East Africa. So we need to look at that and see that how we can adapt, not just adopt, we cannot adopt, we have to adapt, keeping in mind the local conditions here. And this is not something uh, which is, uh, we do it today and tomorrow its relevance is going to go, because in future also, we have to have safe trade rather than just trade uh, per se. So Duncan and Quan Ching, do you, would you like to add anything to this? To this first two or three points or questions? If not, then let me move to a, there's a question for Quan Ching, a question from Mr. Jitesh Khosla, uh, who the question is like this, while ADB has been very supportive about investment in BBIA infrastructure, the demand and use for such infrastructure comes through business to business and institution to institution context. How can such contacts and dialogues be encouraged? Yeah. Um, uh, people, can you repeat the last yeah. two sentences because it's a little bit glitch. Yeah, There's a, Let me yeah. Read that the last two please. sentences, yeah. While ADB has been very supportive about investment in BBI infrastructure, the demand and use for such infrastructure comes through business to business and institution to institution contacts. How can such contacts and dialogues be encouraged? Yeah, I think um, ADB is trying to take a different approaches yeah, as, as mentioned that uh, in the past, we focus more on infrastructure or simply speaking the hard infrastructure uh, because those kind of long projects are easier to be uh, delivered. But uh, as you mentioned that we probably have to look at uh, uh, some other issue uh, because infrastructure is, is very demand side oriented and how to make sure we also address the demand side and uh, we look at the sector as a whole. Uh, for example, trade facilitation is not only about trade facilities. And uh, 
So, so I, I think that things has been changing. The way of doing things has been changing in ADB. The the BB the concept paper I just mentioned for the uh, sector development project, it comes with a, a policy based loan. That's because part so the, the the project do require that not require that, that we will work with the governments to work on uh, the reform of the governments, and uh, so I, I think that's um, the the project formation uh, has to be done. Uh, uh, much more uh, uh, the bottom up. So uh, the uh, com continuous conversation with our uh, DMC governments, residents mission are, are crucial. So I, I personally was the peer review of that project and uh, which will be uh, implemented in the next year. So I think that's an example that to show that, that we are doing things uh, differently. Yeah, thank you. The next one is a very interesting observation from one of our colleagues, uh, Uday Mehta, who is the Deputy Executive Director of CUTS. Uh, he is talking about regulation. Uh, we know that for cross-border trade, number of regulations are there. And some of them are indeed burdens. So how can we harmonize some of them in order to reduce the cost of doing trade? So let me put it this way to again to Guancheng, that is it that ADB is doing any cost benefit analysis of such regulations and to see that uh, some of them can be uh, weeded out uh, and replaced by uh, new regulations maybe, uh, including more uh, easier to follow regulations Maybe we can look at the UK experience of uh, regulatory harmonization, where if I don't, I'm, I'm not wrong, then there is a scheme or initiative where before introducing any new, any new regulation, you have to take out at least two existing regulations from that sector. So any thoughts on that, uh, Wen Cheng and Duncan? Yeah, I, I probably can first share a few thoughts, even though I haven't have a deep uh, investigation about the issue. But first of all, when compare developed countries and the developing countries, uh, the major difference between the customs is that one is customer services, the other is customer authorities. Yeah, for developed countries, we normally think uh, uh, is very service oriented. They manage the risk, they give the freedom and the trust of the shippers. And uh, that's cre create a lot of, uh, of flexibility and efficiency. But on the other side, for most developing countries that take, tend to take a, a, a aspect of a custom, customs authorities. So the, the, the officers are trained to prevent uh, things bad. Uh, however, we need to take into account the risk. What is the risk associated? And uh, because we right now we have a, a very good technology to support us to to manage the risk. And so I think that this mindset change could be crucial. But before the mindset change, I think enhanced institutional capability is crucial because without the a new training and uh, it's very difficult for for the officers, the customers, officers, or the, the people in charge of the customer operations to be, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to change the mindset. And uh, regulations itself is not a really, uh, it's important, but that's not everything because you can easily have a new version of legislations if you, if you have the support from the Congress, but uh, do people really follow the revised regulations? Uh, do people trust or, or to follow the, uh, be, understand how to implement it is still, uh, that's another layer of complexity. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Duncan, would you like to add yeah. to anything? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Yeah, please, if I could, yeah. So I, I couldn't quite get in when you were talking about like the safe, tr safe trading um, initiative. Yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that and then I'll come back to the point on the regulatory reforms in the United Kingdom. Um, and then the first, I mean, when it comes to just, when we're starting to think about C19 and what we're all hoping is going to be a bounce back in the economies, maybe we're also hoping for a bounce back in the connectivity side as well. It has to come back with a with a better built-in approach that has 
issues around safety and biosecurity just essentially just flowing straight in. It flows into the discourse, it flows into the infrastructure design. It means you start to think about border facilities differently. It means you start to think about protocols. And this particularly comes down sort of to the motor vehicles agreement where there's quite a lot of work being done on sort of pre-clearances to just get trucks moving through these areas, you know, moving straight through the border areas, not actually being held there. Um, there's quite a lot of extra work that would have to go in to make these bios, you know, what will probably now be required biosecurity issues sort of built into the built into the system. And it's particularly going to affect, I think, work between sort of South and Southeast Asia. So I don't have any answers to that. I'm just sort of like raising that as another set of things that probably just need to be sort of built in. On the UK regulatory side, I think what is actually, those, those, the issues around having to take two out, if you put one in, is a general guidance sort of for regulators in the UK, and it's across UK government. What is actually critical and what is right at the heart of that, though, is this requirement around consultation with stakeholders who are actually going to be affected by any regulatory change. And it's built in to the business model that civil servants have to solve to work through. And it particularly... I was, I was particularly, I was actually working directly in this in the early 2000s, and it was particularly at that point focused on very small enterprises and the disproportionate impact that regulatory change had on them. I think that is applicable everywhere. And I think the issue is, it does come back to, again, knowing who your stakeholders are, knowing how they're going to be impacted. And it comes directly to some of the things you were talking about, Bipo, about the importance of field work, where you're really get, gaining an understanding of what's going on in communities and enterprises that are going to be affected by um, by all these sort of like new connectivity approaches. Thanks. Back to you. Thank you. Uh, on your second point on the on regulation, uh, we have made note of what you have said and we will ponder over them. But on the first one on safe trade, I think it's very very important, and we need to look at not just for developing new infrastructure in border areas, in border posts, but also need to seriously think about this new concept of uh, off-border clearance, uh, which is, again, uh, ADB is very keen to popularize that concept. Uh, maybe we can have start with some trials, uh, not to do it in all border posts, and then uh, end up with doing nothing. But maybe doing it in, in one or two border posts where the goods, the customs clearance, everything is done in the inland container depots. And then they are put into a container, container is sealed with electronic cargo tracking system, that container can pass through any border post uh, without any checking. Uh, with ECTS, electronic cargo tracking system, there can be real-time checking, not just the cargo, but also whether there is any tampering of seal or not. Those things of insurance can be paid in advance, and things can be done much more in a much more efficient manner uh, digitally. But here again, the political economy issue is very much important. When you have off-border clearance, all those people, and their number is quite large, those who are engaged in transshipment activities. I'm not talking about the quote unquote speed money and those kind of things, but pure transshipment activities. Their jobs will go away. I mean, they will be jobless. So how are we going to have uh, create jobs for them? That's something also we need to take into account. Let me now, uh, the number of questions which you are getting and that, that shows that uh, people are so interested on this subject. There is one observation come question from Anu Sarin from DFID that given the current scenario, uh, it is very important to map national and regional uh, policies and regulations uh, and then juxtapose them with the current political scenario and see where the gaps are. How can those gaps be bridged? Absolutely, this is something which we are going to do on as part of our work 
and then it will be easier for us to do the advocacy or rather policy advocacy in this case to how we can in the best way possible address such gaps then there's a very interesting another interesting question from Ria Sina from Brookings and she is right that multimodal connectivity while it is very important very much needed but it also has high cost implications because of transshipment and things like that how are we going to make it more economical I think if you look at the holistically I mean the whole sense uh, of course, we need to talk to multimodal operators. I mean, uh, fortunately, there are a number of operators in India in particular and also in Bangladesh nowadays, and the number of operators are increasing. We need to address this question to them, actually, that how can we ensure that it is economical for doing trade within BBI and through multimodal connectivity? In the, ca in the case of Bhutan Bangladesh trade via India, the example which I have given in our presentation, uh, the, we have also calculated the cost. You see, the volume is so high because of this uh, use of waterways. At the end of the day, the per unit cost comes down. And that is something which we also need to uh, uh, look at. Uh, very, very carefully. Then there is another question about illegal activities and women's safety. This is very, very important and in border areas in particular. And while this is, is going to be a part of our field work, that uh, we're going to also look at uh, what kind of possible illegal activities which are going on. We know that uh, what kind of activities which are going on. And women's safety is very, very important when you talk about cross border trade. Uh, not just trade, but also passenger uh, transit uh, uh, cross border. So that's something which we are going to take into account. Then Tino Xavier from Brookings again. Uh, a question or observation, let me see. Uh, very interesting address to me and Duncan. That on the Indian side, what do you see as the greatest spoilers and obstacles for your BBI and connectivity proposals? I mean, as I said, you know, I mean, Duncan may add, uh, there are local vested interest groups. Let me give the example of Petropol. I mean, just before Petropol, about a few kilometers away, uh, there is this parking lot. I mean, who owns it? Nobody knows. But you have to pay 500 rupees a day. Uh, and for some reason or the other, it will not be possible for you to cross the border not before seven days. So these kind of vested interests are very much there on the, on the, on the, on the ground. And they are going to be the spoilers and obstacles. And we, we, are, we, we are already witnessing it. I mean, uh, after March, once the border was closed, then it was opened very briefly. Now again, it is closed. And who is suffering trade? I mean, the local uh, people, those who are engaged with transshipment activities in particular, they are the ones who are suffering. Uh, but thanks to waterways and railways, uh, we have been able to do uh, trade with Bangladesh, even when land borders are. So the local political economy is very, very important when we talk about connectivity. And somehow, sometimes we miss this point, but that's something which we should not do in future. Duncan, would you like to add anything? Thank, thanks, Piffle. Sorry, I, I couldn't unmute myself. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just i just add a little bit on that. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously there are lots of spoilers or losers, basically, from any change that comes. And of course, one of the big issues that we have in this area is that the gainers are a very desperate, a very large group, but very spread, not particularly organised, don't have a particular concentration of power. And it's always an issue about how you get their views reflected to like push things forward, of course, and they're the consumers that are relatively, you know, the quite poor consumers across the region that lose out from all these costs that are built into the trade side. Um, 
I think it's always a challenge to see how we actually balance them out in how we give them a greater voice in the in the policy making environment because first of the issues of concentration around power around the borders is an ongoing issue. It is there at every every single border. Anybody who spent any time like going through borders that are going through reform will just see it everywhere. Um, and there's no easy answer to this apart from we have to have in our clear view and clear sights that these are gains that are coming to a broader set of people across the region. Um, and it's relatively small numbers of losers that need, need to be addressed, but their issues around losing need to be addressed directly. Yeah, you can just say the change is coming and we're not going to do anything. There has to be much more proactive engagement and planning around what, what are these people going to do after that particular source of a livelihood is taken away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have got more than 20 questions now, though we don't have uh, that much of time to address all of them. But definitely we are going to take some of them. Uh, we still have some time and maybe we can uh, go a little beyond five o'clock. Uh, but before that, let me thank Mr. Khosla, uh, Mr. Jitesh Khosla, the former Chief Secretary of Assam, uh, for taking a very keen interest uh, in this work. Uh, I will be definitely in touch with you, sir, uh, as we make progress uh, in implementing this work. Again, Mr. Oja, uh, Purusaptam Oja, former Commerce Secretary of Nepal, he has made a very important point. We just shouldn't just look at connectivity in terms of infrastructure, but in order for connectivity, all these connectivity initiatives to be more useful, we need to look at closely, though we may not do very deep work on them for various reasons, but we need to look at closely a number of other subsidiary or flanking issues like customs cooperation, like visa facilitation. And thank you, Mr. Oja, for pointing it out, uh, pointing them out. I mean, this is something which we need to, what we call flanking measures. Uh, there is a central character of the project, central thing of the project. Then there are flanking characters which we need to look at uh, uh, seriously as, as we implement it. Mohit wanted to to know whether uh, he's going to, I, I, I would request Mohit to please uh, uh, write your questions. Uh, Mr. Orun Roy, uh, who is an expert on waterways, uh, he's very rightly underlined the importance of stabilization of navigable channels and for better navigation, good terminals for roll facility, roll on, roll out. We do have a very good road facility in Dhubri, which is a port of call. And now we are developing a number of new port of calls. And I'm sure that over time, we're going to have a good road facility in, in those port of calls for inland waterways in particular. And there comes the you know, possibility of investment. And here I would say private sector investment, not public investment. It could be private sector or it could be public-private partnership for better uh, efficiency in the system. And again, our partner from Nepal, Raju Tuladhar, he rightly underlined the importance of looking at non-tariff barriers. That's like Mr. Oja. Uh, we shouldn't look at, uh, what do you call, connectivity in isolation, but we should uh, look at other flanking issues, particularly various non-tariff barriers, which are technical in nature. Uh, in order to get greater, uh, uh, what do you call, benefits out of uh, all these initiatives. Now again, Constantino Xavier, uh, there is a question for Quan Cheng. How to ensure that ADB, AIIB, World Bank, BFID, USAID, and other developmental agencies they do not develop in their various infrastructure and regional connectivity initiatives. There's a need for greater coordination. And this is very, very important. And I would post this to both to Quan Cheng and to Duncan to reflect on, on, on this point. This coordination among various agencies uh, who are supporting these initiatives, including making investment, capital investment for infrastructure development. So Quan Cheng, would you like to take it first or yes. Duncan? Uh, sure, I probably can go first. Uh, yes. I, I know we have some um, 
communication or coordination among uh, development partners, but uh, it seems not uh, not sufficient enough. Um, recently, I had a talk with the uh, UNSCAP and uh, OECD ITF, and uh, that's during my modern work that we, we noticed that uh, uh, indeed uh, the global uh, transport infrastructure are not really evaluated and the, uh, in a holistic way, and then people do the uh, investment accordingly. Um, but but this is a very big question for me to answer uh, because ADB is just one of the uh, development partners, and uh, I probably need Duncan's help to see uh, how how the development partners can have a better coordination. Uh, but I, I have to say that I I don't really think that there's a strong competition between development uh, partners that because the infrastructure gap is huge. Uh, I don't think there's a, a very serious competition. So so that that's provides us the basis to work together. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Duncan, uh, your take Yeah, point. please. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very, it's a very good question. I think it's I think it is one of those areas where development partners do invest quite a lot of time in it, but it's never enough. Yeah, we all we always need to be doing more. It's quite, and it's because of the size of the area that we're working on, the size of the infrastructure gap, the size of the regulatory gap. Yeah, um, and I think I'd kind of questions for actually. Um, it's just the, the issue. I think coordination. It's going to. It's an ongoing challenge and it, i think and it just reflects a broader set of political economies around the areas where it's 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 about how countries relate to each other it's not just about how development partners relate to each other yeah because in the end we're there as facilitators to help things be delivered and we're not actual we're not the real drivers of of this yeah we're there to work in partnership with political and technical direction that's coming from from other partners but i think my my greatest, having worked in this area for a while, it, it never really feels like a particularly crowded space. It doesn't feel like that there are actually enough development partners working in this, and the gaps are just so huge. I have worked in some country contexts, particularly in Africa, where it's absolutely felt like the space is completely crowded and coordination is the thing that is actually binding constraint in terms of moving forward. It never really quite, I'd, I'd perhaps take a slightly contribute, it never feels that like coordination is a binding thing, stopping things moving forward. It's actually not having quite enough partners in the space. Um, and it's very mixed across different bits of the region, different sub-regions, of course. And it, I think it's probably more problematic, I suspect, in South Asia than it is anywhere else. Um, that's kind of how it feels. Um, I think that does reflect sort of broader complexities in terms of the underlying political economy. Yeah. So I take the point, coordination, we need to do better and we will continue to invest more time in that. Um, of course, with, with AIIB coming into the infrastructure space, that's a, a welcome new partner into the space. And of course, we will work very close with them as we work with ADB and the World Bank sort of in this area. But I would actually send just a general invitation out to others as well to say there is a lot of space for more people and for more organisations to be engaged in this. And if you come along, we will work even harder on the coordination. Thank you. Back to you, people. Yeah, people. Uh, I would like to share one more aspect. Uh, it's about, uh, I think, the sub-regional cooperation uh, platform, uh, the, for example, the GMS, or SASEC, uh, CARAG is still a very good mechanism to, to, mm. in, to facilitate the more coordination. I would like to use the case of a GMS, uh, which, uh, for which uh, uh, ADB has been served as a secretariat. Uh, but the, if, if we uh, do the statistics for the past uh, 25 or 30 years, uh, the total investment has been, uh, the, the ADB country about 30% of the infrastructure investment, roughly 20 or 30. JICA also has a big pie, but still that's still not over the half of it. The, the, the investment still comes from many other partners and the government. Mm -hmm. so, so that would be an example that uh, uh, we can see more coordination in the platform like uh, GMS, Sasek or Carrick. Yeah. 
Fifth one, can you. I just jump back in? Yes. Yes. I just wanted to emphasize Cushing's point there, because I think you know the, these regional institutions, you know, these regional coordination bodies have got a, a very strong track record, and GMS is a has a really, really strong track record of bringing coordination, but it's also allowed itself to be driven by national interest and by a bit more by private sector interests as well. And you can see how it relates to various different things that are going on within that geographical area. And then we also, I mean, I've been engaged quite a bit with CARIC recently as well. And you see how effective an organization that is as well as sort of a coordination thing, but it reflects a broader set of positive relationships and just willingness to cooperate amongst the countries that, that are members. I think, you know, again, it comes back to the the whole whole focus of this of this of this particular seminar and this project around taking a very holistic approach to everything that that we do. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Let me add to what Quenching and Duncan has said on this point. Uh, in this project, we are going to take a close look at the what are the factors behind the success of GMS and CARI in particular, uh, and how we can take lessons from those success stories to this part of the world. But uh, without getting into the details, one major factor I would say for the success of GMS is the fact that the approach that they have taken. I mean, it's not that nothing is agreed unless everything is agreed. If all countries, they do not agree on a project, if two of them agree on a project, then two of them are allowed to go ahead. I think we have to take that uh, approach uh, in, in, in DBI. And we have already seen, I mean, de facto, we're already seeing the, uh, that approach on, on the ground in, in among the BBI in countries. A number of very other very interesting observations, questions are there. Mohit Sippi from the AFID has read, uh, written some very interesting and very important I would say, observations, which I think we are going to discuss later on um, on a more one-to-one -one basis. Eric Nora, our friend from World Bank, he has raised a point which is similar to what Duncan has said about safe trade initiatives. Um, here, the outdated trade regulations are leading to inefficiency. I mean, the reason why we have such regulations is again because of various reasons. One, is that nobody knows who is going to remove them. That would be one. Uh, uh, then there are also, I mean, mind you, that uh, more the regulations in some sense, more the merrier. Uh, uh, I'm not going into the details because in public domain, public meeting, I can't say much more than that. But definitely as through this project, we are going to identify a number of such regulations which can be easily removed. I'll give you just one example. It took us almost four years to harmonize the lunch time or lunch break time between India and Nepal in Luxal border. I mean, there's a difference between about 15 to 15 minutes to half an hour. And it took us a uh, lot of advocacy efforts to harmonize them. Uh, I'm giving a very Small, it may look silly, but important. Because actually we are losing one hour on both sides if you take that into account. Now, <clears throat> one possible recommendations which we could come out of this project, I mean, of course, we have just started it, is that regular interaction between customs, of customs and other officials at border posts. We have tested this in respect to India-Nepal border, a number of borders, Roxanj, Kakarvita, Panitanki, these two places in particular, and they have worked wonders, actually. Uh, several things, uh, several creases, I would say, they are ironed out as a result of such meetings. So we need to regularize, regularize those meetings. We already have Customs Clearance Facilitation Committee on, in India. It's there in all ports. It will be good to see whether such initiatives can be taken on the other side. I'm sure there may be similar initiatives. Let them meet on a regular basis to sort out things 
without referring them to capitals. So the moment they are sent to capitals, I'm sorry to say that things take time, much more time than what is needed. So let me see finally if there is any other pressing questions or observations. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, as I said before, I mean, I'm unable to take number of questions, including from our partners. Uh, uh, so let me just give me half a minute. Uh, let's see very quickly. Uh, my ex-colleague Kanutos from Indian Chamber of Commerce, he has made a very interesting observation. We have taken a note, Kanutos, and definitely we are going to address that. Uh, <coughs> of economic and political stability. So I think it's now uh, better to uh, come to an end of this webinar. Let me once again thank all of you. And uh, before I make some closing remarks, let me request both Duncan and Quan Ching. If you have anything closing remarks in the sense of closing remarks, anything more to add, uh, over to you Duncan first. Right, thank you. Uh, apologies, I'm having slight uh, connectivity uh, problems. <laughs> so the irony is not is not lost on me. Um, I just I don't have any particular concluding comments or to make at the end, other than to say first thing to say just thank you very much for sort of like kicking off. This has been a really interesting um, seminar and discussion, and it's been great to just sort of re-engage into the subject matter. This it does just highlight a practical opportunities are start the concrete sort of impact on the term but also things not that far out from now. I guess with the C nineteen sort of like connectivity sort of bounce back here with an injection of a biosecurity DM in all the approaches that we take. At that point, I'll say thank you very much. I'm back to you, Bipal. Thanks. Thanks, Duncan. Guan Cheng, over to you for your uh, closing remarks. Okay, I, I will have very uh, short uh, comments or response to uh, to comments uh, I during the discussion. Uh, first of all, I have noticed that uh, someone mentioned that uh, the high costs associated with multimodal connectivity. That could be true. But well, somehow that is against what we are doing right now. But however, I would like to point out uh, the structure, the industry structure of the logistics sector is crucial. That uh, in developed country, we do see giant uh, for logistics service providers in addition to retailers. But in many countries, especially developing country, we have huge retailers, but the logistics sector tend to be very fragmented. If the logistics sector, the industry is very fragmented, the benefit from intermodal could be um, seriously affected. Yeah, that, that's cool. we have to pay extra attention to this issue. So the high cost is possible, but uh, it depends on the industry structure. Uh, the second thing uh, is that I'm very happy to see that there's some discussion about a uh, private sector participation. And uh, I think that's crucial. I would like to have more discussion in the future. Yeah. And uh, finally, uh, the, the concluding remark that thank you for your participation. It has been a very interesting and uh, rewarding experience to, to join the this is discussion. I look forward to meeting uh, others in the next two weeks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would like to make uh, one or two points as closing remarks. But before that, I just see that there is a very interesting point made by uh, our old friend Ronnie, uh, Ronnie Buitong from uh, ADB. Uh, about the SASEC customs subgroup. It will be important for us to look at the uh, documents of that subgroup and the progress that subgroup has made. So thank you, Ronnie, for uh, pointing that out. Uh, so while thanking everybody, uh, uh, as I said, I, I'm going to say one or two things. One is that we have recorded it. Uh, we're going to do uh, a bit of editing of the recording and then share it with all of you, including 
those who have registered but could not join us today for some reason or the other. I'm really sorry that I couldn't take all questions for want of time, nothing else. Uh, so let me thank uh, DFID, ADB once again, and our partners uh, from Bangladesh, Union Shamanai, Bhutan Media and Communications Institute, and Nepal Economic Forum uh, for this joint initiative. Uh, I'm sure that uh, as we make progress, this is a two-year project to begin with, and we are going to uh, achieve certain concrete outcomes on, on the ground. So. Next uh, uh, webinar of this series is going to be held next, which is the 14th of July. The time. So we are going to again send out the invitation. And we have a very uh, interesting panel, a number of experts from this region who are going to talk about uh, lessons which we can draw from other regions in the context of ground realities in the BBIA on multimodal connectivity or even intermodal or other forms of connectivity and how we can adapt those lessons. So this is how, I mean, as we know that any meeting like this, normally we have three, four sessions. Uh, now, since we are doing it digitally and it is actually quite difficult if we do a digital session the whole day so we have for three sessions to begin with so thank you very much once again and it was a pleasure to digitally meet all of you and learn so many new things which we have made note of and definitely we are going to take them into account as we implement uh, this work and other than sending you the video recording, we're also going to prepare a brief report. It may, may not be more than three pages uh, of our discussion today, which will help us in uh, sharpening our thinking about this subject, not just this project. So thank you very much. And let me take your leave. Thank you.